sign up who were meant to come to the Monday crack who didn't sign in. So just so they're able to know to come as well. And the other thing that I was wanting to tell you is that I don't, did anybody come to the talk uh, last Tuesday? I think it was on Tuesday in the geology department. So we had a guest speaker whose background is uh, more in engineering, who was talking about tying together some of the concepts, which Kush has already taught you about. So using things like ground penetrating radar and modeling the hydrology of an area to look at how pollution spreads, so how polluted water spreads in the subsurface. And Trish went to the talk and thought that it was very much the good example, a good industrial example of the kind of things that she's been talking to you about. And so we've asked her to come and give a guest lecture the Tuesday after the test. So not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Okay? And so that'll be a good uh, opportunity for you to kind of hear a concrete industrial example of some of the things that we're talking about, and that content will be examinable. So I would encourage you to come to that talk. I mean, it's good for consolidation, but she'll also be going into a bit more detail than Trish was able to. The other thing that I'll say is just a quick reminder. Um, we told you all at the beginning of the course, but the test is on Thursday. The test will be on everything up to the material at the end of this week, up to the material on Friday. And following the test, so the lecture on Friday, the, lecture will be, the test will be in the lecture period on Thursday. In the lecture period on Friday, we're going to basically go through the test and explain what we were looking for for each of the questions. And again, I would really encourage you to come to that because the course and the questions and the type of questions might be slightly different to those that you're used to for a lot of your other engineering courses. So you might be expected to write in slightly more detail, like slightly more material for a particular question. And I think it would be useful for you to come along to that just to get a good idea of what's expected before you have to go and do the exam. Okay, so this class test is definitely meant to be a learning experience for you. And the format's going to be the same as in the exam, which means that the, we start off with some short questions where there's no choice, you have to answer all the questions, and then we'll finish off by having one longer answer question where we'll give you three choices and you'll just have to choose one of those three to write about, okay? Um, and that's as it will be in the exam. So we were debating exactly what the format should be, but we've decided, we've had some requests that you have some practice doing those slightly longer answer questions, and uh, Dr. Doyle and I have agreed that it's a good idea to give you a chance to practice doing that. So it's in the lecture period. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you just come to the start of the lecture, the test will be 50 minutes long, so we want to get started basically at 12. Um, and then, is there anybody who has extra time? I think there is one person who has extra time. Um, I'll communicate with them via email, so we'll sort out something if there's any extra time people who maybe have to go to another lecture afterwards. So, um, like, how long is the paper? Is that 15 minutes? 15 minutes, 5 0 minutes. That's really enough for the test. Sorry? That's really enough for the test. It's pretty short. Sure. I mean, so it's not meant to, you're not going to be tested on absolutely everything that has been covered. It's more, mainly basically just to give you an idea and a chance to practice something with the same format as the exam. So, you know, obviously there's only going to be three of these long answer questions to choose from, so there'll just be three topics. We're not trying to, that's what the exam's for, to cover the full breadth of the material covered. This is mainly, I wouldn't get too stressed out about the class test. Um, it's mainly just to give you, so that when you go into the exam, it's not a surprise, okay? It's to give you some experience, so that you know what to expect. So hopefully it'll be a confidence building exercise. Okay, so we're going to continue talking about landslides in this lecture uh, to wrap up this subject. And just to remind you, the, the things that I wanted you to keep in mind were uh, what are the risk factors, what would you consider if you're assessing 
what the landslide had in a particular place was, but also what different types of landslides are there and how do their different properties affect hazards. So we began the lecture yesterday, not yesterday, on Tuesday, with a video of this very fast-flowing, almost river of rock. Um, and that's an example of a debris flow, which is a particular type of landslide. And a debris flow, what that means is, the debris just means that the material has a range of grain sizes. So going from very large boulders to very, very fine clay particles. The debris appear to look dry. So if you remember the video that we looked at, when you look at it, when it's moving, it appears like it's almost like a river. It looks like muddy water with then large blocks within it. Do you know what I mean? So there's clearly a lot of water present, and that is actually a very important feature of a debris flow. So you don't get debris flows unless there is liquid there, unless there is a lot of water. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, so after a debris flow has happened, you're left behind with something like this. So it's just this jumble of large blocks. You can see that this debris flow has moved down this channel, and you've left with these very large boulders. And so after it's finished, when you're looking at the signs in the landscape, then you just see this very large, these very large, poorly sorted boulders, and it doesn't look like something which moved that fast. It doesn't look like something which was going to be moving at tens of meters per second. But as you've seen, that when it's moving, it is very energetic. And the reason for that is that water plays a really important role in debris flow. So to have debris flow, you need two things. You need there to be water present, and there needs to be this range of grain size. So it's very important that you have these very big boulders, but then also you need to have the very fine grain material, the clay and the silt particles as well. And the reason for that, the reason that these large material can be transported so quickly, can flow in a turbulent manner, actually all comes back to poor flow pressure. Okay? So that same thing that we've been talking about in the practicals and in the previous lectures. So in order to have a debris flow, you need to entrain water with the landslide, and that can be because the landslide has been caused by heavy rain. It can also be when a landslide reaches a feature like a river where there's already water. So it can actually entrain water by moving into a pre-existing uh, feature. And the critical thing is that you need to create and sustain these very high pore fluid pressures. So basically, Another way of saying that is the water can't escape. The water can't flow out from between the rocks and then down into the earth. So you can see that almost as soon as the debris flow stops moving, you're left with something which just looks this. The water just drains down. But during the movement, the water is entrained within the landslide. And there are two reasons for that. There are two ways that you get this fluidization, or sometimes called liquefaction. Okay? One factor, which is important, is actually that really fine grain material, the mud and the silt, which is being carried along as well. So even though it's the large blocks that cause the damage, the fine grain material is important for allowing you to have these high pore fluid pressures. And the reason for that is it increases the viscosity of the water. So this very muddy water is more viscous than pure H2O, and that prevents it, or it slows the drainage. It slows the draining of the water from the large blocks in the landslide. The other way that it can happen is if you have water-saturated sediment, which is then very rapidly loaded. So basically, one common way that debris flows form is if you have a mountainside, and at the base of that mountainside, there is some um, unconsolidated sediment. So this is unconsolidated sediment. We call it alluvium. This is often the remains of a previous landslide, actually. So these are uh, jumbles of uh, sand and boulders which have water within them. Okay. Now, what can often happen is you have a rock fall 
for a rock slide where the mountain will fail and basically be deposited on top of this water-saturated sediment. And what will happen is, because this is happening very quickly, this water can't escape. And so you're increasing, you're loading this water-saturated sediment, so you're increasing the stress acting on it, and that's then going to raise the pore fluid pressure. If you remember, if your pores are saturated, so they're full of water, and that's important, they do have to be saturated, because water is incompressible, that will basically counteract the load of the material which has come across, and that basically means on this surface here, there is no normal stress. So it's very easy for it to shear. It's very easy for it to slide outwards very rapidly. Okay? And as long as there's enough water trapped underneath, that will continue to move. And they can move extremely long distances from the original site of the landslide. Okay, so this is one of the main differences between something which is quite local and only affects something along the lines of a distance which is similar to the height of the material that it's fallen from, to something which can travel many kilometers away from the site of the impact. In sediments, in soils, there are also different characteristics. And so one type, one setting, where you very commonly see these types of flows, these debris flows, um, are in things like mine spoil heaps. Okay? So effectively, what happens in a mine spoil heap is it's basically just the material which has been dumped, the material that the people mining were not interested in. So they've ground up the rock, they've found the ore that they're trying to extract metal from, and everything else they just dump into piles near to the mine. Now, one of the features of that is if you just drop sediment, which is all broken up, into a pile at the surface of the earth, there'll be a lot of pore space, okay? So it will be very poorly consolidated, okay? So basically, what I mean by that is if you consider the rock as a whole series of particles, there are lots of gaps in between the particles. And that's something which you typically find in mine spoil heaps where the material has just been deposited at the surface. And one feature of that is when it starts to move, if it starts to be sheared in a landslide, because there is so much pore space, as it starts to move, these will settle in such a way that the pore space is reduced. Okay? Um, so that is sometimes, so sometimes you would, yeah. And one effect of that is because you're reducing the pore space, if it is water saturated, if it's water filled with fluid, then that's going to increase the pore fluid pressure. And that's another way that you can get this liquefaction. Okay? So there are some types of soils which have this property. They're called contractional, so that means the pore space is contracting as it starts to shear. There are other types of material, there are other types of soil, um, often the more naturally occurring ones, which are dilative. So if you have something like a clay-rich soil, where there is very little pore space, actually, as it starts to shear, it's likely to form fissures, and you're actually likely to increase the pore space. And so those would be then less likely to have this debris flow behavior. Okay, so just to be aware that that is one of the reasons. And if you follow the newspapers, if you notice in the news, you very, you very often have these extremely serious disasters in areas such as rubbish tips. And there's a recent one in Central America where a rubbish tip collapsed and killed a lot of people. And in mine spoil heat, and part of the reason for that is because of the properties of the material, the properties of the soil, okay, that it encourages this debris flow-like behavior. So this is an example which was from Wales, and this basically there was a, these houses were basically all owned by mine workers, so this is a mining area, and the actual mine itself was up in the hill above the town, and of course you put the spoil heaps as near as possible to the mine. So you had these large spoil heaps, this coal mine, um, immediately above the village, and there was heavy rain. The material, a landslide, started, it started to shear, 
it liquefied and then it traveled down into, into the village and actually this was where the school was. So basically all of the children in this settlement were killed, like pretty much every single one. And one of the features of this is because when it stops moving, the water drains out, it actually becomes very hard to dig into. You're left with this very dense, consolidated material. So it took them a long time even to get to the bodies. So this is something which is often not considered enough. So the way that you dispose of material which has been moved from one place to the other is very often the cause of these kind of tragedies. There was another example of the landslide within the rubbish ship that I spoke about recently. So what what, it, what is now thought happened there was you had this large rubbish tip which often uh, things like food waste was being put in it so it smelt really bad, it was right next to a settlement and so what people did was put layers of soil on top which was basically to absorb the smell, to stop the smell. But what that then did was you were basically creating layers, strata within the tip, so weak layers, which can then fail, and again, there was heavy rain, and so the water goes through, it reaches one of these soil wares, and that acts as a, as a weak layer to cause material to slip off. So these... What's the importance of the definition of the service of the So in terms of debit clothes, the, you would think when you look at the, when you, you would think when you look at the product, so you just have this really coarse grain bolt that's actually we see beforehand. The fine grain material, that's important because it raises the viscosity of the liquid. So when you have muddy water, it's somewhat higher viscosity, and that means that it can travel with the boulders and the water for further before the water drains out. Okay, so that's, that's why the range of grain size is important. And actually, debris is a term, a geological term, which implies that range of grain size. So, okay, actually, let's skip over that because I've probably got to ask. Okay, so another warning factor, um, which we talked about a previous lecture, is joints. Okay, so jointing. So, if you remember, joints were lines of weakness which have opened extensionally. And they're formed as the rock moves to the surface, or as you erode the rock above, it reduces the compressional stress, it reduces the lithostatic stress, because there's less material above you. And because rocks are very weak in tension, as they get to the surface and that lithostatic stress drops, you get these, uh, you get these joints which form just very small amounts of opening, so tiny, tiny amount of displacement. But they come in sets, and they have these very strong orientations. So you can see here, I hope that you have two very strong sets of joints. And this is in a road cutting. And one of the things that I'd like you to notice here is that it's very easy for material, because these are quite steep joints, you can see that blocks, so rhomboidal blocks, have fallen out of this road cutting. You see the spaces where they were, because they're steep. So here's an example here. And because of the orientation of those joints, because they're nearly vertical, it's very easy for that to happen. So this will frequently have landslides. This is an example from India. Um, we had another one before. And if these joints were horizontal, these lines of weakness were horizontal, it would be much harder for the material to collapse in this way. So the orientation of the joints can make a big difference to the stability of a slope, and that is something which varies over quite short distances. And this is actually from the same area. This is to some extent a before and after photo, and you can see that the road has been swept away. So you can't get information on jointing from geological maps. So every time you go to build a road, every time you take a road cutting, someone needs to assess the amount of joint and the orientation of the joints, and that feeds into how likely that slope is. Um, just one more thing to give you a local example. So Table Mountain, the peninsula formation, if this is uh, layers of sandstone. There are a lot of near vertical joints 
in the Table Mountain sandstone. And actually, you'll often hear about the Peninsula Aquifer, sometimes in the news. That water is actually within these joints in the Table Mountain sandstone where it's underground. And what happens in Table Mountain is, between the sandstone, you have layers of finer grain material, layers of mud, and water will come down the joints and along those panes of mud and wash away the finer grain material. And so what then happens is you basically undercut this block of sandstone, you have these near vertical weaknesses, and so you get these large, almost rectangular blocks which then fall out. So if you walk around Table Mountain, you'll see a lot of these big, almost rectangular blocks, and they're basically being controlled by the layers of finer grain material that can be washed away, and this vertical jointing. Okay. And if you th the fine grain material is not permeable, so the water can't flow through it, so it will come down the joints and then move along the fine grain bed and then wash that material away. Just a reminder that not all earthquakes are dramatic, so often you will have movement just of uh, millimeters per year, but structurally that's still a problem. You know, just because you're only moving a few centimeters in a decade, that will still cause your walls to crack. And it will and there are often telltale signs. So if you look at things like fence posts and power lines, that's one way of identifying this systematic lean is one way of identifying the fact that there might be very slow movement in the area. Was there a question? Yeah, I was wondering if you still call that an earthquake if it was like a really deep term. So, so not an earthquake, but a landslide. And so perhaps not a landslide, but the more technical term, the umbrella term, would be a mass movement. Okay, and that's basically just saying you know, mass, which is moving. And that applies whether it's fast or whether it's slow. It all fits under the same umbrella. Okay. And so just an example of what that might look like. And I think that I'm probably, okay, so here is an example. And you also have intermediate examples. So that was very slow. I'm just going to turn the lights off because you can't really see it so well. Um, so this is another example. And you can see this railway line has been seriously deformed. This basically happened overnight. And it was in another coal mining area. And if you zoom, and then a few hours later, it looked like this. And you can see that the train tracks have been completely changed. Fortunately, the trains don't run at night in this area. So this was spotted before it caused any damage. But this aerial photograph lets you see what's happened. So you have the cracks here which is showing that this side of this spoil heap is moving down, and it's then pushing up this toe. So this is what we call a rotational landslide. I'll show you in a second what it looks like in cross-section. But effectively, what's happening is you can get these kind of mass movements even if you're in an area which is topographically flat. So you place this spoil heap, you dump this material here, you have an area with unconsolidated sediments. Alluvium is a type of unconsolidated sediment. And what happened here was you had unseasonably large rainfall. The water level rose. So the poor fluid pressure on this near horizontal plane of weakness has been increased. And that's allowed this to just rotate and push up the railway lines. So I just wanted to give you a couple of examples that you know it's not always in places which are extremely steep and these very fast-moving landslides, but you do have to think about it whenever you're building on unconsolidated sediments and you have to take into account how the change in water table, how change in flow pressure is going to affect it. So we've talked about a lot of these before. So when we're talking about over steep and slope, uh, erosion, what I mean by this is one very common place where you would see these types of uh, events is where you have, so if we have a slope which is at about 30 degrees, so a typical slope um, of unconsolidated sediment, 
if this area has a river flowing through it, that is then going to erode that loose material and move it downstream, and that's going to then steepen the slope. So one of the ways that you get away from your angle of repose, one of the ways that you over-steepen the slope in order to uh, cause failure to occur is through erosion. And that could be natural erosion. Excavation is basically man-made erosion. Right? It says volcanic ash here. I haven't really talked about that. But another setting that you get is large landslides in volcano, volcanic settings, because basically there you're dumping larger material quite quickly. And so that will often be dumped at an unstable slope, at an unstable angle, and then it will fail quite soon afterwards. And we've spoken quite a bit about increased water table and increased water content, and that can be through rainfall. Uh, it can also be man-made through creating a dam. And cyclical loading, so we've spoken a bit about how earthquakes can trigger landslides. And in some places, in many places actually, uh, where you have a monsoonal climate, where you have heavy rainfall at certain times of year, that's a dominant factor in controlling whether or not that slides occur. Another thing that you may not have thought too much about, but which is very relevant in South Africa, is fire. So when you've had recent burns, you dramatically, dramatically increase the a number of landslides. And often these types of after fires, you can have, if you have heavy rainfall after fires, you often create these debris flows, which are the particularly dangerous types of landslide. And there's a few reasons for that. So after the fire goes through, you are destroying the vegetation, and that both reduces the interception. So basically, if the rainfall is hitting the trees and the leaves before it reaches the ground, it reduces the energy, and so it reduces its ability to mobilize material. It also is going to reduce the number of roots, or the amount of roots. Roots can burn surprisingly deep down into the ground. Um, and that, again, decreases the cohesion of the soil and makes it more unstable. And it also, and it also can increase the ability of the water to, uh, well, no, so that's what it should do. It decreases the ability of the water to infiltrate deep into the ground. It rather stays in the surface layer. And that's because you destroy the organic matter within the soil. You will also reduce the structure, so basically there's less pore space after you've burnt out all the roots and the organic matter in the soil. And so you have this large quantity of ash, which is easily mobile, and you keep the, you keep the water in this upper layer, and that just takes all of that material down hill. And remember as well, remember again what we were saying about the importance of having the fine grain material to raise the viscosity, to give you a debris flow. So that ash is a very good way of doing that. Okay. So the ash, it's not so much the ash. So basically what happens with the ash is it immediately gets swept away, it immediately runs off. It's more that if you have a lot of roots, if you have a lot of organic material within the soil, it's going to be less tightly packed. Okay, so basically there is more pore space, there's more structure to the soil. And actually, uh, particularly in, well, I, I'm sure it's true here, but particularly in the US, um, they found that where you have property damage following a large fire, it's not actually generally the fires that destroy the property. The fires maybe burn a few houses, but people are quite good at having fireworks. I mean, you'll know that it's quite rare, actually, for parts of, if you have firefighters on the ground, you can generally create a fire break to prevent fire from moving through a settlement. Okay, so as long as you have warning, if it's the kind of situation where you're burning a wide area of national park, you can defend the edges of that quite well. 
but it's much harder actually to defend from the landslides that come afterwards because they happen at an unpredictable time. There is not an easy way to stabilize all of these often quite large areas of ground to prevent the materials from being mobilized. And another, another factor is that if you have the tectonic settings, we'll talk a little bit about tectonics before, but quite a few of my examples have come from India. And one of the reasons which I've used examples from India is that it's an area which is currently undergoing compression. So India is moving northwards and colliding with Eurasia. And what that does is it actually creates mountain ranges. So the two materials, the two areas moving together, basically causes the area to crumple up. It causes it to compress. That creates large mountain ranges. And so that generates high relief and steep slopes. It also tilts the strata, it tilts the bedrock, and there are frequent earthquakes as well. Because this is an area which is currently being deformed, you have lots of earthquakes, and again, they act as triggers, as secondary features. Uh, so the landslides are a secondary hazard of the earthquakes themselves. Human example. So again, this, this follows some of the this follows some of the things that I've already mentioned. So this is another example from South America. You have the slope, which is primarily volcanic material. So by that I mean ash. So we've said that often if you have this rapidly deposited ash, it forms these very steep slopes, which are unstable. It also uh, can create debris flows because you have that fine-grained component of material that can be obtained in the landslide. But another thing that we haven't spoken about is in this particular area there was widespread deforestation by developers uh, in the area and that this is something else which can significantly decrease the stability of slopes for the same reason that fire does, because you're removing the roots which are providing structure to and cohesion to the soils. Um, and so this was an area where the issues were raised in advance, and this is also an area which is this is also an area which is in an earthquake-prone area, and this was immediately following an earthquake. And so again, this is a good example. And also, buildings were being constructed immediately below these steep slopes. So this is another example of a very preventable hazard. Why? Does the fact that it's primary volcanic material affect? Sure. Okay. So perhaps what I should have said to give you a little bit more information is that it's primarily volcanic ash. Okay. So when you have an eruption, when you have a volcano, you often deposit these very thick layers of ash over a very short period of time. Okay. So basically, you're dumping a very large amount of material. The slopes at the sides can be quite steep. It also can be eroded very easily by rivers, so you often cut down very quickly, and so you again end up with these very over steepened slopes. And it is also relatively easily mobile, easily mobilized when you have large amounts of rain, and it creates this very, uh, this quite viscous fluid, which again helps with debris flows. So basically, it prevents the water from draining away, and so it carries both the ash and also the coarser grained plants with it. So another feature which I haven't talked about, so this is some of these things that we've discussed before. So again, this is to remind you that the orientation of planes of weakness, so that can be different strata or rock, it can also be uh, different layers of more clay rich material within the soil. If you recall when we were talking about the Coulomb failure criterion and we were talking about the coefficient of friction, we said that clay minerals 
were the ones which tend to have a lower coefficient of friction. Also, the permeability, the ability to water to move through this material plays an important role. So you have permeable material at the top, so water flows down, and then it reaches an impermeable barrier at the clay layer, and that again is going to give you higher pore fluid pressures at that point. And in this particular case, you've also removed the lateral support for these strata because this area is being excavated to provide a flat area for building a house. And this is basically giving an example of something of like a famous case, a famous area um, in California in the 60s. So this was uh, a desirable development. So quite often these places are on quite steep slopes because you get a nice view. Um, again, they didn't want to have it to become densely developed because it was meant to be like exclusive homes for rich people. So they used uh, septic tanks rather than having a proper sewage system. And again, if you have septic tanks, you're basically adding weight to the slope. So the water is going to be relatively dense compared to unconsolidated sand. And it is in an area, well, as I said before, where you have these very steep slopes. And what happened in this case was they'd identified this isn't from the same area, but this is just to show you the type of features. They'd identified evidence in the landscape for previous landslides. So you saw this typical scar that you see in unstable slopes, where you have this ridge at the top where the material is broken away, and then you have this hummocky toe area. And it's basically doing the same rotation that we saw in the uh, spoil heap example before. And that was not, that was not, uh, that was not, well, it wasn't, it was ignored. Um, they actually fired the geologist who did the report because he gave a report where he said that it wasn't safe to build there. This actually comes up, will come up again when we're talking uh, about the earthquake. So very commonly, very commonly disasters like this happen when there's corruption, when, there, when the people are not following the proper procedures, and that's something which should be, you should be aware of. And again, this weak rock with varying permeability, so that's like what we talked before. You have a permeable layer, and then an impermeable layer, impermeable layer underneath, and so the water can get down, but then it gets stopped by the clay layer, and that then allows hypofluid pressure to be developed. And Pretty much as soon as they finished building, they found that the slope began to creep. And as soon as they stopped creeping, the ground began to creep, and then it fell catastrophically. So you can see these are very fancy houses. You can see the bottom of the garden has just disappeared. The zoom out kind of shows you a bit better what's happened. So you can see this is failed on a fairly thin slope and you can see this. This is a slide in case it hasn't broken up. You can see this garden is now some meters further down <laughs> the hill. Um, yeah? Uh, is it possible to compact the soil? To compact them? Yeah. So there are there are some things that you can do to stabilize it. Generally, uh, generally, the best thing to do is just to prevent the slope being over steepened. So you would usually grade it. So if you go outside there, just outside our building, you know that you've got that steep slope behind the car park. And then there are these stepping concrete structures going down. And that's basically to reduce the slope of the hillside there and also to give it more cohesion to prevent that from failing. Okay, so rather than compact the soil, you control the slope. In some cases, so in this example, this is another example from Norway. This is a major landslide which is coming from one of these joints, so these very small displacement pre-existing weaknesses. 
And this was something the building codes were followed. What they did in this case were they were reinforcing the slope with bolts being drilled perpendicular to the face, being drilled into the hillside. And the idea there is if you go far enough through, you're basically using these steel bolts to hold the joints together to prevent them from just falling outwards. Although the problem with that, as in this case, is you can get these very large landslides which have very deep failures. So it's quite difficult to drill far enough back to be sure that you really stabilize the slope. But that is something which you do often do and which can be useful. So the same area, you can see the slope, you can see this planar feature where the failure occurred. So this is the joint and you can't see any sign of the bolts which they put into the face. So they basically hadn't put them deep enough. So this is something else that you could potentially have assessed to see that there was this fairly major weak plane which was some meters in. And so if you had altered the depth to which the joints which had been drilled, the bolts had been drilled, then perhaps you could have prevented that. But it is a difficult thing to do. Um, another example, so this would be a slide. Remember, flows are where it breaks up and fluidizes. Slides are where the whole area just is transported back to you. can see the trees are still standing. And again, this is also to show you that you don't necessarily have to have an earthquake or rain or hypo flow pressure. We've spoken about those in most of the previous examples. In this case, there wasn't any of those other unusual warning signs, but it was a case where if you looked at the geological map, you would have seen that the strata here were dipping towards the roads. They were dipping downhill into towards the area where the building took place. So the geological mapping and understanding geological maps is a, an important part of assessing this kind of hazard. So again, you can see the smooth surface where it's failed, and that's basically the boundary between two uh, units of different types of ways. Sure. I don't understand what causes the injury. So that is that is basically the the point is basically that you don't always have a cause that you can point to. So it isn't always triggered by a particular event, or at least not an event that we can put our finger on that we know about. But that isn't to say that there was no way that this could be predicted. In this case, the warning sign was basically the dip of the geological structure. Okay, so that you knew you were building with these weak planes within the structure of the rock dipping down towards the slope. And so what you're going to be doing in some of the practicals later in the year is you're going to be looking at interpreting geological maps to work out which way the strata are dipping. And I think you'll probably have already been lectured on that a little bit as well. Yeah, a little bit. But you'll get some chance to practice it. My main reason for putting this in and my main reason for talking about it is because I know that, that, that often the geological maps is quite a tricky part of the course for some people to get their heads around, and so this is just emphasizing why it's important to do. Okay, so just to finish off, how can you reduce losses or what can you do? So the first thing is to identify risk areas. So we've talked about many of the different factors that you might consider. You can also make sure that you don't have anthropogenic uh, sources of hazards, so don't build in a way that makes a stable slope unstable. That often happens because you want a nice flat area to build on, and so the easiest way to do that is to dig out the toe of the slope. Um, the other thing is to engineer water drainage to prevent the strata from becoming water saturated and prone to fail. So what we're saying there is where you have these impermeable layers of clay, the water can't drain out the bottom, and so it will become saturated relatively easily. And so if you were to drig drainage through those impermeable layers, you would prevent that from happening. And as we've mentioned, you can use things like bolts to control landslides if they do so. And the procedure that you would go through, you would look at the geological map, you would look at the slope, you look at the rock type and the dips of the strata, 
if you can identify previous landslides, signs of previous landslide, that's a good warning sign. So that was one of the examples from Malibu. And also you can establish grading codes. So you basically can say, given the soil, given the coefficient of friction, given the material that we see here, what slope will be stable? What slope is acceptable in our development? And sometimes that can cost slightly more. So you have to do things like we have just, I can see it from here, before that car park. It costs money to do that, but it is worth doing because the damage will often be much more. OK, so I'm going to stop there. These are some of the questions um, which you might want to think about, types of things that you might be asked in an exam. So I won't go through them, but it's something for you to go through in your head and check that you can answer questions. Just before everybody goes, does anyone have any other questions about the test or anything like that? I'd rather kind of do it to everybody rather than individually, just so that it's fair. Anything like that? No? Okay, good.